All right, um, just as the last people are coming in and finding a seat, good morning everybody. Welcome to the first talk session of the day. Um, you're here to see uh, Kate Heddleston here, who's um, uh, got a Master of Computer Science from Stanford and works as a web app developer. And she's going to be talking about how engineering environments are killing diversity and how we can fix it. So um, take it away, Kate. All right, thank you. Welcome. So once upon a time, canaries were used as an early warning system in coal mines. Toxic ga gases like methane, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide would kill the canary before it would affect the miners. I like to think of women in engineering as the canary in the coal mine for our engineering environments. Now, normally, when the canary is dying, uh, you know that the environment is toxic and you should get the hell out. What the tech industry is doing is looking at the canary, wondering why it can't breathe, going, lean in, canary, lean in. <laughs> when one canary dies, we go and get another canary, because getting more canaries is how you fix the problem with the canaries in the coal mine, right? Except the problem isn't that there's too few canaries. The problem is that there's too little oxygen in the mine. When women are leaving a field at the rates that women are leaving software engineering, which is much higher than the rate that men are leaving the field, that indicates a problem. Now, these anaerobic engineering environments are hurting more than just gender and race diversity. Those just happen to be the salient symptoms of a larger set of problems. So the problems with our engineering environments are hurting a lot of different people from a lot of different demographics. And they hurt problem solving, creativity, and productivity on our engineering teams. This is my talk, How Our Engineering Environments Are Killing Diversity and How We Can Fix Them. My name is Kate Heddleston. Uh, I'm a software engineer from San Francisco, although I've been doing the digital nomad thing for the last year and traveling around. If you want to web stalk me during the talk, that's my personal website. And if you want to tweet at me during the talk, that is my Twitter handle. There are these two young fish swimming along, and they pass an older fish swimming the other way, who says, morning, boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and fi finally, one of the fish turns to the other and goes, what the hell is water? And I love this introductory anecdote from David Foster Wallace's very famous speech, This is Water. And it's about how things in our environment can become so commonplace to us that they actually become invisible. Things that we see every day fade to the background so much that we actually can't see them anymore. And that's a little bit uh, of what this talk is about. It's about factors in our engineering environment that we take for granted that we can't really see the effects of because we don't really realize that they're a part of the environment. They've become invisible to us. So what is an environment? An environment is everything around us, everything that doesn't come from inside of us. These things can be tangible or intangible. It can be physical, like the layout of a stage. This room is normally just an empty square, but you add a raised platform, some lights, a bunch of chairs facing one direction, suddenly you have a stage that tells you a lot about where you should sit and how you should behave. There's also intangible factors like social norms. So anyone in this audience could actually go stand in the back corner facing the wall if they wanted to, physically, but there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't socially. People might think you're crazy, they might judge you, you know, whatever. Clothing stores have known that environments impact our behavior hugely for quite some time. They did a lot of research and they found that the more excited people are, the more they purchase. So if you've ever been in an Abercrombie and Fitch or a Hollister or an American Eagle in the mall, you've probably been assaulted by loud house music. And uh, that gets people in the store excited. So most people are walking around and they have no idea that this music playing over the speakers has any effect whatsoever on whether or not they choose to buy that pair of distressed jeans and deep v-neck sweater, but it does. It can seem somewhat fatalistic to give our environments too much credit for our behavior. We like to believe that we are in charge of our own individual actions and our destinies, but it's important to understand the power of environmental factors because it can take a darker turn. In the 70s, psychologists did a lot of research on the effect of authority on people's behavior. And the reason they did all this research is they were really interested in understanding how, during World War II, Nazi Germany convinced an entire country of mostly decent people to commit war crimes. So this research in the 70s, to summarize it, 
found that an authority figure, specifically wearing a white lab coat, which is a symbol of scientific authority in our society, was able to push people in a study where a participant was administering shocks to another person, could push people past their moral bounds, and not just past their moral bounds, actually into the realm of torture. And these people were just average students at colleges, you know, the normal people who sign up for a, for a study for $20. Uh, but just the presence of an authority figure wearing a white lab coat was enough to drastically affect people's behavior. So environmental factors are very important. Today, I'm going to talk about four. I was going to talk about eight, and then I realized that was insane because it's a 25-minute talk. Um, the four factors I'm going to talk about are critical feedback, argument cultures, onboarding and team debt, and the null process. Now, you'll notice most of my slides don't have a lot of text on them. I've already written very in-depth blog posts on these topics. They have all of the research, all of the citations. They're at kateheddleston.com slash blog. So if you want references later, you can find everything that you could possibly want there. So first up, critical feedback. Clifford Nass, a late professor of human-computer interaction at Stanford, did a study with a Japanese car company. This Japanese car company had built a driver feedback system, a very sophisticated system. It had the best sensors, used artificial intelligence. It figured out when people were driving poorly, and it was supposed to let them know to help improve their driving. But they brought on Professor Nass to help them do a study to see the effects of this system, because they were like, hey, we should test it before we ship it, which was a really, really good thing because what they found was, found was somewhat counterintuitive. So the system gave very well-intentioned feedback. You know, when someone was driving too fast or driving poorly, it would say, hey, you aren't driving very well. You should be more careful. Now, if you think that people were thrilled to hear that they weren't driving very well, you are mistaken. People hated it. People got so angry at this system. And that wouldn't have mattered so much if it just bruised their egos, but actually improved their driving. What they found was the opposite. Not only did people get angry at the system and resent it for criticizing them, they actually started driving worse. They started speeding, oversteering. One guy got so angry that he crashed the simulation. And Cliff Nass summed it up in one of the best research lines I've ever read. Even stunningly accurate criticism might not be constructive. So the major thing about critical feedback is that it does two things. First, people resent the criticizer. And second, it doesn't actually bring about any meaningful or constructive change in people's behavior, which is usually the entire goal with feedback. Now, this wouldn't be a diversity issue in workplaces if criticism were given evenly to everyone in the workplace, but it's not. A recent study done by Kieran Snyder about reviews and feedback given to men and women found that 88% of reviews given to women had critical feedback, as opposed to 59% of reviews given to men. And not just that, of the critical feedback given to women, 76% of the critical feedback given to women was personal in nature, as opposed to 2% of the critical feedback towards men being personal in nature. And personal criticism included things like, um, you're being too abrasive, you should smile more, you should let other people shine. Things that aren't really about someone's work, but about their actual person, how they express feelings and who they are. So how do we level the playing field in the workplace for men and women? Given that everyone hates criticism, we should just remove it. So giving one group more criticism than another can have dire consequences. If we're criticizing women more than men, best case scenario, it might make it look like women resent feedback more than men. But they don't resent feedback, they resent criticism, which all humans resent across the board. It's just that women receive it more than men. The worst case scenario with criticizing one group over another is that you can actually materially, materially damage that group's performance because people tend to do worse on criticized tasks, according to research. So criticizing one group more than others is bad, but criticizing anyone is generally bad, so let's just not do it. Now, you might think that's crazy. How do you give someone feedback if you don't give them critical feedback? Well, it turns out that there are tons of ways to give feedback. Critical feedback is just one type of feedback. Um, the best way to think about removing criticism is to think about telling people what you want them to do as opposed to telling them what they're doing wrong. So if you want someone to do something differently, be explicit about the behavior that you want to see. Instead of saying something like, don't open such large pull requests, you can say something like, 
open smaller pull requests. They're easier to review, they get merged faster, and you'll get better feedback on them. So by re removing words like no and don't, you can actually reduce a lot of the critical feedback that you give to people in the workplace, and you can give them better feedback that's more actionable. The other thing you can do is be very, very careful about the personal feedback that you give people. Stay on the topic of work. Their work, their, their job as an engineer, their job as a manager. Telling people about their feelings, telling people about their personal expression is generally not appropriate, but it's also much, much more commonly done against women. So just be careful when you're talking to someone about their individual person. Argument cultures. So what is an argument culture? An argument culture is the use of aggressive opposition to weed out weak ideas and logic. The idea is that if we attack the weak parts of an idea, we'll leave only the strong ones. We use arguments in two famous formats in our society. The first is debates, and the second is courtrooms. And the metaphor for arguments in our society is war. We can attack or defend a position. We think of the people we argue with as opponents. We can gain or lose ground, and ultimately we can win or lose an argument just like a battle. And it's this emphasis on winning that's actually very dangerous. When an individual has a, has a goal of winning, that can actually be at odds with the overall goal of finding the best solution or finding the truth. And what we found is that when an individual's goal is winning, people will do crazy things. And we've learned this from sports. In order to win in sports, people have doped, cheated, broken people's legs, deflated footballs, and any other number of crazy thing to be declared the victor. This type of behavior also shows up in the workplace. And the workplace is not a regulated argument culture. It's specifically an unregulated argument culture, which is very different from courtrooms, debates, or sports, which have refs, uh, moderators, and judges for a very, very good reason. So in our unregulated workplace argument cultures, people will also cross ethical boundaries to win. And what does that look like? That can look like anything that's off topic, basically, to win using size, aggression, or loudness to get someone to back off in an argument, making personal remarks to undermine their credibility. A very common one is, you seem frustrated, which uses the trope that when someone is emotional, it undermines their rational thinking, which is scientifically disproven. It's not true, actually. We're all emotional all the time, and also, we're all irrational all the time. So these kinds of tactics are used when people are trying to win in an argument. And they're systematically worse for women for a couple obvious reasons. The first, if size and loudness are rewarded in the workplace, women are often at a size disadvantage. So that kind of starts off on an uneven playing field. Also, women are not usually rewarded as much for aggression as men. It kind of violates our expectations of feminine behavior. So having a workplace that rewards aggression is also not so great. And finally, personal remarks about emotions are more often used against women. So that line, you seem really frustrated, is one that's more often levied against women to make them seem too emotional or too crazy to be credible in an argument. So in order to get rid of these unregulated aggressive arguments, there's a couple of things you can do. Think about the type of discourse that you want. What is your end goal? During a brainstorming session, for example, you want as many ideas as possible. So defer judgment. Don't allow criticism and don't allow arguments at this phase. Everyone should give ideas, everyone should speak, every voice should be heard. The whole point is to get more ideas. When you're starting to narrow down from a brainstorming session to make a decision, this is where a lot of heated arguments can crop up. So help people stay on topic, help people support ideas with facts and information, and if two people happen to be on opposite sides of a heated issue, use a regulated debating environment. Have two people present their arguments and have a third party system judge and assess a winner. This has worked very well in courtrooms and debates to find arguably better solutions than we would have if there weren't judges. Onboarding and team debt. In engineering, we talk a lot about the concept of technical debt. Technical debt is the eventual consequence of bad system design. So if you're shipping features very quickly, um, you aren't necessarily getting everything tested and integrated. You're not really thinking about your code architecture enough. And if you ship these without taking care of all of those things, you accrue technical debt. And over time, if technical debt isn't addressed, it can topple your system. It can actually halt forward production of features. All engineers have to be on deck to fix you know, some major code architecture thing so that, that you can continue moving forward. Well, team debt is a similar concept, except it applies to people. 
Team debt is the idea that if people aren't properly onboarded, trained, and managed, they're not operating at 100% capacity. Every person who's not operating at 100% capacity starts to accrue as team debt. And eventually, if team debt isn't addressed, you can have something like this, where every new person added to your team actually decreases overall productivity. The best way to go about addressing team debt is actually onboarding, systematic onboarding. At a very high level, onboarding is the process of taking someone from outside of the team, outside of the company, and making them an integrated, productive, and confident member of the team. Onboarding is important for training people not only on the technical skills that they need for their job, but also on the, the company culture and the internal processes that they need to be successful every day. The important thing for diversity is what happens when there isn't systematic onboarding? These are some Dr. Seuss sneeches, the star bellies and the non-star belly sneeches. It's a story that it's very fun to read. But the idea is that if there's no structured onboarding, People have to rely on existing social structures to get up to speed. Just because there's no onboarding doesn't mean that people don't have to learn about all of the ways that things happen at the company to be good at their job. And so the way that they do that without onboarding is they have to make friends with the people at the company, they have to rely on social events, going and asking questions, kind of wandering around the office basically trying to get the information that they need. This will systematically be better for people who are like the existing group. People who are like the existing group at a company are going to have an easier time communicating with people. They're probably going to have similar hobbies, similar social events. They're going to have an easier time getting the information they need to get up to speed in the absence of systematic onboarding. So systematic onboarding should re remove reliance on these social structures for training somebody. In other words, it should help people systematically learn about the technical things they need to know, the company process, and the company culture, so that people who come on board who are different than the existing group have just as much of a chance at being successful at their job as people who are like the existing group. And finally, the fourth thing, fourth thing we're going to talk about is the null process. The null process is what happens when no process is put in place. And by no process, I mean no formalized process. There's actually no such thing as no process. Anytime someone completes a task and does a set of steps to do something, by definition, a process was used. Now, the null process is named for null pointers. Um, as most people in here know, a pointer is an object that points to a meaningful location in memory. It could point to a number, a letter, a string, another pointer. A null pointer points definitively nowhere. It is a pointer that specifically points to nothing. And this has very important properties in computer science. However, if misused, a null pointer can crash your program. Similarly, the null process is not nothing. It's simply a process that points to nothing. It's an informal ad hoc process where nothing is documented and everyone does something their own way. The null process comes about a lot of times because companies are terrified of unnecessary process or bad process. Someone somewhere experienced bad process and they're afraid of that and so they don't want to put in place process and have that happen again. However, the null process is actually a subset of bad process. The null process is a breeding ground for unspoken expectations. A manager might think, hey, we do this task this way, everyone should know this, but everyone doesn't know this, especially if it's not written down. The null process is also incredibly hard to teach new employees and as we just talked about with onboarding, you need to be able to teach people how to get things done in their job. So having null processes all over the place makes it really hard to train and grow your team. As far as diversity goes, the null process is really dangerous because you can't inspect bias in a null process. Twitter just had a lawsuit filed against them. A female software engineer who was there between 2009 and 2014 is suing for gender discrimination. She was denied a promotion twice, despite having excellent reviews, no critical feedback, no points against her. And what she says is that by not putting in place a formalized, documented process, Twitter created an environment where men were systematically favored over women. It created a tap-on-the-shoulder culture. And while Twitter probably wasn't explicitly trying to, to promote only men, you can't inspect bias in a null process. By saying that they had no process, they weren't able to take a look at the data or to say, hey, maybe this process is broken and we should fix it. So the null process can be very bad for diversity because you could have biases all over the place. And we all have biases, every one of us. And so you want to have a way 
of taking a look at how you're promoting people and how you're working with people at your company so that you can reduce these biases. Now again, you might be thinking, yeah, but I don't really want to go put a ton of process in place at my company because process can be kind of terrible. And it's true. But remember, there is this world of bad process, and the null process is actually a subset of it. So by having no process, you already don't have a great process in place. There's a couple things you can do that are fairly lightweight and um, easy to implement. So the first thing that you can do is use checklists. Checklists are easy to create, easy to edit, and very collaborative. There's a great book called The Checklist Manifesto, and it basically documents how checklists have revolutionized different industries. It was actually checklists that made the unflyable B-17 bomber flyable. It was checklists that reduced the line infection rates at the Johns Hopkins ICU from 11% to 0%. And it's a very elaborate system of checklists that make it possible for us to build super complicated skyscrapers and buildings. So checklists are hugely powerful, but also very easy to create. And they seem so simple that it's almost ridiculous, but what it does is it reduces the need for people to remember every step that they need to do a process. So you can start creating checklists, and you can make it collaborative. So allow people to add steps or edit steps or remove steps to finally get to the place where it's the minimum number of steps that someone needs to know to do a task, no more, no less. And anyone can come in and read the steps in the checklist and be successful. So you can have checklists for how engineers respond to support tickets, um, how code is code reviewed, how people are promoted to engineering manager positions. And the next thing that you can do is you can actually automate process. I'm a huge fan of automating process whenever possible. And it's a natural follow-on from checklists because once you have a more concrete checklist, you can actually codify it. An automating process basically reduces the amount that humans have to rely on recall to understand how to do something. The great example is having a goal of one-click deploy. If an engineer can, can click a button and deploy code to any of your services, that greatly reduces the number of steps that somebody has to do in order to deploy code. It also makes it much easier for people coming on board to learn how to deploy code, and the computer is the one that remembers all the processes and all the steps for actually deploying the code, so there's less, less of a chance that there's human error in completing a complex set of command line instructions. All right. In conclusion, we talked about four areas of engineering environments that are harming both the team overall and diversity. The first is critical feedback. Now, critical feedback is bad for everyone, but it's disproportionately given to women. And since it can cause resentment and hurt people's performance, this can actually harm women's performance and response to feedback overall. The second is argument cultures. Argument cultures promote a culture where, where winning is the goal. And winning can lead to unethical behavior. This unethical behavior, again, hurts a lot of people in the organization, but can disproportionately silence women. The third thing we talked about is technical onboarding and training. Onboarding, again, is good for everyone at the company, but a lack of onboarding can hurt people who aren't like the existing team. And finally, we talked about the null process. Null processes, again, Bad for everyone, because people don't understand what to do, but disproportionately bad for women and minorities because it's difficult to inspect bias in a null process. So there are things that you can do to address all of these things. Some of them are easier to do than others, but there are solutions. And a lot of these problems can be fixed the same way that problems with our software can be, can be fixed, with small steps incrementally, one problem at a time. And that is my talk. We have time for questions. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, yeah, now we have um, until, we have another five minutes for talks, uh, for questions. Um, please limit yourself to questions and keep comments and anecdotes for, um, for the corridor. So the discussion continue, can continue after 20 past the hour in the corridor, so. Hi, great talk. Um, Starting a group or a company or any sort of cultural unit of people is itself sort of a null process. Mm -hmm. Can you provide a checklist for how we can start a group like that and have positive processes starting out? Yeah, so there's some topics that I didn't cover today. Um, I'm writing a blog post series, so I will be writing about them, but there's something I call agile management, 
It's like agile development, but um, it's for managing people. And the idea is that in agile development, what you have is you have a high feedback system. So bug tracking, logging, to know what's going on so that you can respond very quickly. And it's kind of like the overarching process for people management. It's this idea that you should be listening and getting feedback from your employees all the time and being very responsive. So having in place practices where you can you know, start creating checklists right away. So when someone says, hey, like this process is, is like undocumented and I don't really know what to do, you're like, great, like, let's start making a checklist for it. It's not perfect, but we can do something. And so being very responsive in management, the same way that we're really responsive when we program, I think is a great way to get started. So while software engineering is, is by no means the only field that has problems with diversity, it, it certainly seems to be one of the, the, the fields that is least diverse. Um, but I note that a lot of the, uh, the issues you've raised here don't appear to be specific to the software engineering industry. Could you comment a little bit about why, what makes software engineering different why, or, or why these specific issues uh, come to play more in, in this specific uh, field? Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. Like, a lot of these things I talk about happen in other environments and to many different groups of people. Um, I think that one of the big things is there, there's a great essay called The Tyranny of Structurelessness, and it's this idea that, like, when you don't have structure, it becomes implicit. There's no such thing as no process, no structure in a group of people. And in technology, we love the idea of, like, flat hierarchies and um, letting people have autonomy and freedom, and we've taken that too far, I think. Like, I love autonomy and freedom, and I, I love, you know, not having, like, super, super hierarchical structures, but that doesn't mean that we can't put in place processes to make things better or put in place structure that helps people understand how to get promoted. So I think we're just a little bit on the extreme side of, like, kind of hating regulation, and that leads, that it just leaves a lot of room for, for biases to run rampant and for people to not really inspect what they're doing. All right, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, thanks Hi. for your talk. I am curious whether there is or can be a sort of open source-ish, -ish, open source -ish, um, very specific um, corporate conduct or like uh, corporate governance code of conduct document that could instantiate these sorts of policies with um, very specific uh, documented, like documents you can start your company with. So rather than starting mm -hmm. from zero and, and trying to make amendments based on the people you're working with, have a pretty good starting point based on other people's work in this space. Yeah, like a startup guide to management or something. Yeah, um, yeah I think so. Like I know that for startups and small companies, a lot of the management things are, it is kind of a special case. Like you are a small team and you don't really want unnecessary process. And so, yeah, absolutely. I think that we can, we can put things together. I think there's also a lot of tools that can be built, like open source kind of people management tools that we can throw together that would be really great for companies. Hello and thank you. Um, I, l I like the idea of agile management that you mentioned from the previous question, but I have a kind of a follow-up question to that about uh, how do you ensure that you, you get the feedback that you need for that process, especially if your environment maybe is so toxic that the people that you need to get feedback to, from aren't willing or feel safe to give it to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing that I've seen squelch feedback is basically just really negative responses to it and people not listening. So if you go and say something to a boss like, hey, I think this is a problem and I think we should change it this way, and they're like, no, we don't want a necessary process, or I'm going to completely invalidate your problem, like, that's the number one killer. And so just having an open mind where it's like, okay, I'm going to acknowledge your problem and maybe the problem needs rewording, maybe the solution isn't exactly the right one, but this idea of like keeping the channels open, writing everything down, listening, and, and just like taking in that feedback in the same way that you don't go to a customer who's like, your product is broken, I can't use it, and go, you suck at using technology. Like you wouldn't do that to a customer, so don't do that to your employees either. Like believe they have a problem, figure out what the root of it is, and figure out basically how it can be solved. And I think that's, that's probably the best way to foster feedback. If people know that they're gonna be listened to, and responded to, they'll tell you what they think. Thank you. All right, thanks for the talk. Yeah. Um, there are certain communities that thrive on critical culture and sort of see it as a point of pride mm -hmm. uh, for maintaining quality and things like that. And I was kind of curious about if, whether you have any pointers on how to change that sort of conversation so it's not so confrontational, but that to say that 
maybe it's not the best way to produce the best software. Maybe it's what? Not the best way to be so critical and hard hitting. And um, yeah, there are definitely very critical, I guess, cultures. I think the reason for that is that criticism is largely for the person who's criticizing. It makes us feel better to criticize others. It's very rarely from the perspective of the, the person that the feedback is being given to. And so I'm not entirely sure how to change a culture of people who are just like saying whatever they want to say to people because it makes them feel better about themselves. Like you have to, you have to convince people that fundamentally like that's not healthy and not helpful. And so I tend to avoid those cultures because once it gets going, I'm, I'm really not sure what can be done. So if anyone has any ideas, you should definitely share them. Just the last, this is the last question, and um, the conversation can continue out in the corridor if you're interested. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, you've put a lot of work into developing this blog and this talk, and that's probably wound up being a second shift for you, mm -hmm. which is uh, common in the workplace when advocating for culture changes like this. How do you mitigate that? being basically your second job and um, encouraging buy-in from other people to distribute the labor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, it's pretty common, I think, for minorities of, of whatever kind to come into the workplace and kind of be handed this burden of like changing the environment. Hey, you're the only woman, so help us like change our processes. And I'm like, yeah, sure, make me a director. Like if I'm gonna put together onboarding and I'm gonna like run management, that's fine, I'll be a director of engineering. <laughs> Um, so. Awesome, and thank you very much, Kate. On that note, um, <laughs> thank you, and uh, everyone, we're just up for a 10 minute break now. Yeah, so I'm going to go straight outside the room. Anyone who wants to talk to me can meet me out in the hallway, um, and I will be out there in just a moment.